welcome to another Off the Shelf Board Game Review. This week we're going to look at the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project is a very aggressive worker placement game for two to five players, ages 13 and up. Approximate play time is going to be just shy of the two hour mark, especially with a five player game. Of course with a two player game you probably get that down to about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Be sure to also check out my full tutorial video for the Manhattan Project where I'll teach you how to play the game. Then I'll show you some sample gameplay going through multiple rounds so you can see just how everything interacts and learn exactly what I mean when I say this is an extremely aggressive worker placement game. The Manhattan Project retails for $50 and while on the surface it may not seem like you're getting a lot for that $50, this is one of those games that can be pretty darn deceiving for your dollar value because some of the components that come with this box are absolutely 100% fantastic and probably I feel safe in saying that some of these components are going to be the best components in a class you're ever going to see or ever have seen in a board game. And when I'm talking about that, I'm specifically talking about the workers that come with this game and you know the workers are the pieces you're going to be playing with the most in this game. And these workers are made out of some of the thickest cardboard I have ever seen for a cardboard component out of every game I have ever played. These cardboard components are so thick, they're thicker than a casino chip. And you remember, this is cardboard and casino chips are pretty large. These workers would actually dwarf some of the board games I have. And I'm actually talking about not the cheap board games, I'm talking about some good quality thick boards that come with board games. These components are thicker than those boards. It's amazing just how thick these components are. And while I know honestly some of us have gotten spoiled by seeing the wooden meeples that come with some games, those wooden meeples can also jack the price of a game up straight up through the roof. So even though these aren't wooden meeples, the cardboard on these is absolutely fantastic. I have no complaints about the workers used for this game, whether you want to call them cardboard meeples, because they're large enough to deserve that. Now the rest of your components that come with the game are your more standard fare. The cardboard used for the money is your pretty standard stuff. Not overly thick, not overly thin, pretty decent quality definitely nothing to really complain about the game also comes with wooden cubes and these can be for the yellow cake again your pretty standard wooden cubes that come with more than a thousand different european games i can mention they're pretty standard fare but nice including in the game and actually i'm starting to get to the point where i'm actually starting to like the wooden cubes versus the old standby where you get the little cardboard tokens for various different aspects of the game now the game does use the smaller than standard size game cards and while generally I'm not a huge fan of the smaller cards, at least the ones that they give us are pretty good quality. They're nice and thick. They have a good snap to them. They're definitely good quality cards. They're laminated. And this is one of those cases where I can actually appreciate the smaller cards because they do fit on the game board much better than it would be if they actually used the large cards. So it's a kind of a design decision. Again, I'd like to complain about the fact that they're smaller cards, but I'm going to go ahead and actually ignore that complaint for once because I actually appreciate how it makes this game actually have a little bit of a smaller of a blueprint which is nice in a five player game because when you have all five of these player boards out plus the main board if you had standard playing cards these would be much bigger and so would the main board so I'm going to go ahead and say good idea and at least they made really good quality very good linen finish on these cards they're going to last a long time they're extremely durable now speaking of the boards themselves the player boards are a little bit of a thinner card stock a little bit not quite poster board but not quite the thickness that's used through from a board game or a, I should say a standard board from a board game they're still pretty good quality I'm not going to complain I've seen a lot of companies when they bring out board games and stuff like that this use a standard cheap really flimsy poster board so it's actually pretty decent not as thick as I was hoping but still really good quality finally we have the game board itself it looks really good especially when you have it laid out it's very easy to read very easy to understand and the board itself is a pretty decent thickness. One of the things I do appreciate about the board though itself is that it doesn't feel very cramped at all. It feels like it's more than large enough to accommodate all the components. Plenty of room for everything on there without feeling cramped and yet designed very well. And one final thing I want to say about the game board. I appreciate how this game uses a lot of symbols making the game fairly language independent when it comes to the game board itself and for the cards. It's one really nice design decision they made with this game. It's very visually simplistic now don't take that to mean that the game itself is simple visually the game is very simplistic if you just learn what a couple symbols mean it's very easy to teach this game symbol for the scientist is a little guy with the sunglasses and everything you know is in a square it means it costs to produce it everything on the bottom means exactly what it's produced it's standard across the cards too what it costs what it produces 
what it costs, what it produces. Very good design, sorry, design decisions that they put towards making this game, making it very easy to teach, very easy to learn how to play the game, but there's also some very deep strategies, and I'll get into that when I reach the review part at the end of this video. Of course, all this visual simplicity and ease, in a, ease of the game wouldn't mean much if the rule book was very obtuse and pretty hard to decipher. And I'm very happy to report that is not the case with this game. This is a very fantastic rule book. I don't see any reason why anybody couldn't sit down, read this rule book, and sit down, teach this game to other players without having any problems. I've never had to look online for a fact for any questions I've had about this game. I learned how to play the game by myself by just opening the rule book, reading through the rule book, sitting down and playing the game with other players, and I never had any problems at all. Definitely a very well designed rule book. Very nice, easy language. Nothing's very obtuse. It explains everything very well, breaks everything down into various sections. They did a really great job with this rule book. They did a really great job with the symbols used for the game. Kept everything nice and simple so the game is not getting in your way of learning the game and the game itself is not getting in your way of your playing the game. So you can sit down and enjoy this very well designed game and also making a great introductory worker placement game that although while difficulty and complexity wise it's not an introductory game it's easy enough to teach to people who are not familiar with the mechanics of worker placement so they sit down learn about the genre of worker placement games and really enjoy worker placement games themselves and i say that as me personally i was never much into worker placement games yet 2012 which was funny to say two years ago now brought out two of my favorite worker placement games lords of waterdeep and the manhattan project Never was much in the worker placement games until I played these two games, and now I really enjoy worker placement games. Overall, I think you're getting a really good value for your $50 here. You're getting a great worker placement game that's not hard to learn, very easy to teach other players. You don't have to anybody have anybody teach it to you because you can simply learn the game from the rule book, which is a fantastic rule book. I think overall it's a very fantastic value for your money. If I had to lay one complaint against what you're getting inside the box, I do have one minor complaint. I really think the First Nations expansion should have been included in the base box. It's 8 or 10 cards off the top of my head. I can't remember the exact amount. Adds a couple extra Asian nations to the game. Now, I know you can go online and buy it for like $5, but honestly, I think since it's just a couple cards, it should have been included in the box, especially since it makes the game feel more personalized. And by that, I think the game plays a little bit better with the nations because it feels like you're actually superpowers fighting against each other. And again, if I had one complaint, I really think the eight or ten basic nations should have been included in this box. Every time I do a review for a board game, I like to take a few minutes to discuss two things that are very important to me as a board gamer. One, just how family friendly a board game is. And two, just how well a game plays at certain player accounts. Now for the first thing, you know a board game always says a suggested listed age on the side of the box. Unfortunately that's not always accurate for the simple fact that sometimes board games have to list that because of the smaller components or for various reasons and some games may say it takes 14 or up. Yet it could be fantastic for younger kids or for families or anything like that. Good example of that would be Crossmaster which says 13 or up and it's a very simple game that you can play with younger kids 7 or 8 and it's designed to actually be a family friendly game. The other aspect I'd like to discuss is player count. Now some games are great at certain player accounts and just completely fall apart at other player accounts. So I'd just like to take a few minutes to discuss the various player accounts for each board game review so you can see how it may play differently and see if it's still good at all those player accounts. Now the Manhattan Project lists as a game for ages 13 and up and I think this is one of those cases where it's actually a little bit too high of a minimum age requirement for this game. I think this game can very easily be played by people under the age of 13, possibly even for 10 year olds or maybe a very bright 9 year old could very easily play this game. Now the game is very, like I said during the description of the components, it's extremely language independent. All you gotta do is learn how to read a certain amount of symbols. Once you learn what those symbols mean, the game is very extremely intuitive. It's probably one of the most intuitively designed board games from 2012 I can think of and the worker placement genre. The game uses some a couple very easy symbols that are very easy to pick up on, and that's why I think that this game can actually be appreciated and played by younger age players. Now the game can be very deep mechanically, it can be very aggressive, it can be very cutthroat, and those may be some things you may want to consider before you throw a, a nine-year-old down in front of this game because they may get upset when they have another player land all their bombers and completely take out one player's factories and make them lose a couple turns while they try to rebuild their infrastructure. 
the game can be very, very direct, very blunt, and very cutthroat. And that's something that young players may have a problem with. Now, that's very easy to remedy. Simply don't bomb the other player. Don't start using espionage. Now, if you're wondering if that makes the game less fun to play or destroys the balance of the game, I can happily say that no, it doesn't destroy the balance of the game. You can very easily and very happily play an entire game without using a single space on the espionage track and without using a single airstrike. Unfortunately, with my player group, that has never happened, and I don't think I've ever seen a game with my group go without at least five or six airstrikes and at least 12 hits on the espionage track, but we're pretty cutthroat like that. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that this game can easily be played by younger players, and it does play up to five, which makes it, in my mind, a pretty good family game. If you have a couple of younger teenagers, 10 or 11, and you're looking for a game to play with a family, I think this is actually a great game to play. Probably could be a good introductory worker placement game after you've moved up from some of the extremely basic ones. I think this is a good intermediary worker placement game. And if you have a group of adults, I actually think it's a fantastic introductory worker placement game. As a matter of fact, if I had a choice between the Manhattan Project or Lords of Waterdeep, I'd just judge my group between the two. If they like the fantasy aspect, I'd probably pick Lords of Waterdeep as the introductory worker placement game. If they liked history, I would definitely pick the Manhattan Project. I'd really have trouble picking between the two games because I think they're both fantastic worker placement games. Now I'm getting a little off track here. I just want to bring it back to the point that I think the Manhattan Project can definitely be played with a family, kids ages 10 and up without many problems. You just want to be careful not to use the espionage track too much because you can definitely be very cutthroat and definitely screw another player if they're not ready to be recovering from it or if they're not raising their own personal defenses and airstrikes. You can definitely screw other players with those very quickly, especially if they're caught unaware. The Manhattan Project list has a game for two to five players and this is one of those interesting games that while fantastic at all player counts, at least in my opinion, I have noticed that the game does play a lot differently at the various player counts. A two-player game, in my opinion, plays a lot different than a five-player game of the Manhattan Project. Matter of fact, I think some spaces in a two-player game are almost detrimental to be used, and one of those good examples, in my opinion, or at least in my experience, is airstrikes. Now, my experience in a two-player game using airstrikes has actually almost puts you behind the curveball because you're spending more resources into the airstrike, which allows your opponent to actually get a little bit ahead of you because they're spending less resources advancing their track than you would have by throwing money at the airstrikes to try to slow them down. We've actually learned that in a two-player game, the espionage track is actually your most effective use of the resources on the board. Because for three dollars, not only are you preventing an opponent from using a space, you're actually gaining the resources for one of their spaces, kind of double hitting them, which makes it really efficient to use espionage in a two-player game. Now the odd thing is in a five-player game, we've actually learned it's actually the opposite. In a five-player game, airstrikes seem to be extremely efficient, where espionage seems less efficient. Another nice thing about this game is that adding more players doesn't seem to really add a an exorbitant amount of play time to the game. You can still get a five player game of the Manhattan Project done in under two hours pretty easily, especially with players who are pretty experienced with the game. Now there are a few perceived negatives that I will throw at the game with five players and in my opinion these aren't negatives but I can see these being negatives for some players. It is extremely easy and there's nothing in the rules preventing you from doing this for four players to gang up on one leader who is perceived to be in the lead and literally bomb the heck out of them, espionage the heck out of them, and just really just move them all the way pretty much back to the Stone Age because you just pretty much wipe out all the resources. And if that is something in gameplay that's going to bother you, you may definitely want to keep this game closer to the two or three or player count because like I said, in a four or five player game, if one player looks like they're about five or ten points away from winning the game, I can guarantee you the other four players are going to start launching airstrikes, they're going to start launching espionage, they're going to do everything they can to slow that player down, and guess what? There's nothing in the rules to stop that from happening. So this is actually one of those games where the more players you add, the less you want to be in the lead. The best optimal, best playing strategy in a five player game is actually to be in second place, but barely in second place and watching what first place player is doing, making sure they're not getting so close at 35 victory points where they'd be winning the game. And I'm sorry, I mean 45 victory points where they'd be winning the game. So you want to be watching player number one and when you think they're getting close, you want to be having a strategy set so you can just leapfrog ahead and take the victory away from them. In all honesty, I have trouble recommending the Manhattan Project at a perfect player count. This is one of those games I've enjoyed at every single player count from two to five players. Just know that it's going to play differently depending on how many or many players you have. 
and it's definitely going to allow you to start dogpiling and ganging up on a leader when you start adding more players. If that's something that bothers you, keep it to the lower player account. If you don't care, I definitely recommend that higher player account because it can be really fun playing a five player game of the Manhattan Project. Prior to 2012, I wasn't really much of a Euro gamer. Basically, if you gave me dudes on a map or a whole bunch of miniatures to paint or dice to sling across the board, I was happy as can be. And I really didn't give too many Euro games much of a chance. Interestingly enough, 2012 changed my opinion on what a Euro game could be and that can be a lot of fun. The Manhattan Project just happens to be one of the games from 2012 that helped change my opinion. I wasn't much into worker placement games. Then I played the Manhattan Project and I had a heck of a lot of fun that helped me start learning to start appreciate other games. Now the Manhattan Project really hooked me in by a couple really cool things. One, I really liked the fact that it was very easy for you to be very aggressive against another player, use airstrikes, bomb the heck out of your opponents and just really ruin their day. And For me, that seemed really cool. In my opinion, before I'd ever seen the Manhattan Project, my opinion of a Euro game was pretty much my opinion of Dominion, multiplayer solitaire, where everybody's just basically working towards a eventual goal, talking but really not interacting because there's not much they can do to stop to each other. Now, I'm not trying to make this a rant against Dominion because I do realize Dominion with some of the expansions is definitely different than that, but I'm talking basic Dominion just so you understand what I mean here. The Manhattan Project intrigued me by the fact that you can directly interact with other players, you can screw with other players, and oddly enough, I actually like the theme. Add in the fact that the game has a lot of replay value by the simple fact that you have all these different factories and buildings that are going to change every single time you play the game. This game is never going to play the exact same way twice because you're going to have different factories. You're going to have different opponents playing each other where you're going to have an opponent who may be a little more defensive, then I guess that's a good word to use because they're not going to really use airstrikes against you. And then sometimes you're going to play with opponents who are just going to be outright cutthroat. They're going to be throwing airstrikes against you every single round if it's possible, just because they can. Maybe they'll be throwing out espionage just because they can. That's one of the cool things I really like about the Manhattan Project is you can play it very offensively, cutthroat, go directly for the jugular, or you can play as a more relax kind of game where you're each basically you're doing your own little thing building your own civilization working towards the eventual goal of building the best bombs getting the score and winning the game I also really like how this is one of those games where you have to be paying attention to every single thing your opponents are doing if you're one of those people who likes to stay focused on your own player board and staring at your own player board and you're completely oblivious to what everybody else is doing I can guarantee that this is going to be one of those games where you're going to lose and you're probably going to lose it quite often because you're not going to be paying attention to what your opponent's doing, whether they're buying their uranium or the plutonium or they're building up their infrastructure and they're pretty much going to walk away with the game. This is definitely one of those games where you have to be watching what your opponents are doing like an absolute hawk, paying attention to every single thing, single thing they're doing and don't be afraid to adjust your strategy, what you're doing on your turns especially if you see that your opponents are going to start making your life a little bit difficult. This isn't a game where you can just blindly ignore your own defenses because if you do and you have an aggressive player, they're going to take advantage of that because they're going to throw airstrikes at you. They're going to start using espionage. Also, you don't want to make yourself look like a good target by getting one of these fantastic little inventions right here that maybe one that gives you a whole bunch of resources paint a nice big target on your head so they can go ahead and use espionage against you and go ahead and take that building from you. Definitely want to be watching what the other players are doing constantly, and that's something I really love about the Manhattan Project. Now, I've been talking about for you know a long time what I do like about the Manhattan Project, but I definitely want to mention a few things that could be considered negatives. Now, for me, these aren't negatives because I think they're awesome, and they're actually what drew me into the game the first time I played it. One of the biggest negatives I can throw at this game is that in a five-player game, where everybody's playing, it is extremely easy for everybody to dogpile on one player, especially if they're not playing smart and they're making it very obvious that they're pulling away with the lead in the game. There are definitely enough spaces in this game for three players to very easily dogpile on one player, and if you paint a big bullseye on your forehead, some other player is definitely going to take advantage of that bullseye and take aim at you. And what I mean by that is if you're getting ahead, you've got 35 points in bombs, you're playing a five-player game, you're about 10 points away from winning the game, 
and nobody else is even within 20 points of you, I can guarantee that the next thing that's going to happen to you is an airstrike and maybe another airstrike. And then the fact that you've been telegraphing, the fact that you've been slowly working up your plutonium, making everybody else realize that you're probably trying to build a plutonium bomb and build the game, I can guarantee that they're going to do a little espionage and make sure that they put some workers on your plutonium factory so you're just not going to be using it anymore, slowing down your machine. So if this bothers you, the fact that you may pick picked on, you may want to have a good playthrough of the Manhattan Project before you throw down your hard-earned money towards this game. Because in all honesty, except for a gentleman's agreement at the beginning of the game, there is nothing stopping this from happening. There's nothing in the rules, nothing at all except for the spaces on the board. Now, of course, there are ways to defend yourself. You can always be smart and make sure you're building up your air force. You can also make sure that you personally are using this espionage space, even if it's just to throw the space away to make sure nobody else is unit against you. You can definitely do that, but that goes back to what I said earlier in my review. This is a game where you have to be paying attention to what all the other players do. I have seen some people get up and walk away from this game and say, this game is very cutthroat and they don't really enjoy that. And I've sat there and said, yeah, it's cutthroat, but what if you would have done this, this, and that? Do you think you could have stopped us from being cutthroat against you? And they kind of stop, think about it for a minute and say, you're right, I just didn't plan well. And that's something that you have to understand about the Manhattan Project. This game is very brutal for poor planning. You gotta be watching the other players, you gotta be paying attention, you gotta be modifying your own strategy. You can't have your head stuck in the sand, bull rushing forth, one dominant strategy, and that's the only way you're gonna play the game because if you do, you're going to be trampled in the ground, and you're going to look up while somebody else activates the final bomb and wins the game. But on the other hand, if you're making sure you're keeping your head up and your eyes open, it's pretty hard for all the players to shut you down. You just have to make sure you're constantly monitoring everything that's going on. I think overall the Manhattan Project is a fantastic worker placement game. I like the theme. I like the mechanics for the game. I like how you can be very direct versus the other players. I also like how... The game is very simple to teach, but has a lot of deep strategy to it, and I love the fact that the game is random every time you play it. Different setups, different strategies, the game is going to play slightly differently every time you play, and that's one of the best things I like about the Manhattan Project. Now, if you do decide to pick up the Manhattan Project on my recommendation, and I personally recommend you do, especially if you like worker placement games, I definitely say pick up the very first Nations expansion. I believe it comes with eight cards that you can add onto the board, and the way those cards work is they... Basically, every person is going to start with one nation at the beginning of the game, which is going to give each person their own special power that only they can use, and not even espionage space will allow another player to use your special power. And helps add a lot to the theme, because there is a theme to this game. It's, you know, the Atomic Age, and it makes sense for the nations to be involved in the Atomic Age. Definitely recommend you pick that up. I think it's under $5. It's probably more like 3 or $4. You have to check the Minion Games website to confirm that, but I think it's 3 or $4. Definitely worth throwing in your basket when you pick up this game. It makes the game, while it doesn't change the game that much, it just adds a little bit more to the theme. In my opinion, the Manhattan Project is a fantastic worker placement game for two to five players that allows a lot of aggressive gameplay, a lot of deck direct confrontation, and is a lot of fun. And for me, fun is having a lot of player interaction between the players. If you're looking for a good worker placement game with a lot of direct interaction, a lot of cutthroat, and a lot of aggressiveness, potential, check out the Manhattan Project. This has been another off-the-shelf board game review for the Manhattan Project. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please leave in the YouTube comments below. And also be sure to check out my tutorial video where I show you how to play the game and actually go through a sample gameplay. Thanks again for watching.